Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. KBOO is in the middle of our spring membership drive. You can show your support by going to kboo.fm slash give to become a monthly sustaining member today. With your help, we can reach our fundraising goal. In the wake of Trump's presidency, the Me Too movement, emboldened racism, rising gun violence, and culture wars, it's no wonder that so many of us have been seeking meaningful change. The author of the book we're discussing today took a bold step that many have considered. She moved her family overseas. Spirit dampened with mostly anger where there was once laughter, she risked it all in the search for a more meaningful connection with herself, her family, and the world. As she embarked on a complete life reset, she journaled for a hundred days, capturing the emotions, observations, and reflections along the way. Our guest today is Amanda Maley, author of the new book, Sidetracked. Amanda has worked for some of the largest advertising agencies in the world, advising brands like Intel, Adobe, Nike, Microsoft, and Visa. Since she was a child, writing, photography, and dance were her centering creative outlets. Amanda received a journalism degree from the University of Oregon before getting her first consulting job with Intel. She now owns her own strategic consultancy, A-List, advising startups, mission-driven companies in the careers of women and BIPOC leaders. Hello, Amanda, and welcome to The Pathway Show. Thank you, Paul. It's nice to be here. Now, your book is centered around the idea of a life pivot, a reset. What was the backstory behind your need for that? Well, at first it started out as a bit of an escape, I'll be honest with you. It was a time in my life where I felt like I was a little suffocated from the way I was living my life, um, the demands of motherhood and full-time job that I traveled 80% of the time for, and just the state of the world itself and everything that was going on around 2015, 2016, and leading up to even uh, most recently. I just needed a change and uh, I decided to take a leap of faith and my husband and I um, looked for an opportunity for him to go overseas and get in uh, the education international school cycle there and he landed a job as the head of the secondary school in Tirana, Albania. Okay now how did that happen you know why <laughs> Albania how how did you come to choose Albania. I mean, couldn't he have gotten a, a gig somewhere a little more? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you don't get to choose these things. And to be honest, I didn't even know where Albania was. Um, I know that makes me doesn't doesn't make me sound too intelligent. But it's true. I, I just so you know that when we did this, everything was brand new to me. And he actually interviewed at quite a few places and did get some job offerings from uh, other other locations like Thailand and China uh, and a couple others. But once we looked at everything that was being offered and then also getting a, instead of um, a lower level job, he was offered the head of secondary school. So he's the principal of the high school. And it just seemed like a really good opportunity to jump in and try this international career and see what it would be like. Now for so you, Albania chose, Albania chose us, I guess, is the way it goes. <laughs> we didn't, it wasn't our first pick. Well, it makes for very interesting reading the contrast between Albania and America. And, but there was more going on for you, right, in, in terms of a reset. I mean, you wanted to step outside of your career, but there was also a lot of uh, things that, psychological things that you were uh, dealing with. Can you uh, share that uh, with us, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I am biracial. I'm half Filipino. I am a woman. And I identify as a woman of color coming up through the corporate America world. And after about 15 years through different advertising agencies and representing different brands, you know, it was a very trying time for me. I encountered quite a few things uh, coming up through those ranks. And I really had my head down and focused on this idea of success. Um, and to me, you know, and many, many others, you know, what the definition of success looks like, 
a lot of it was assimilation into a man's white world. And that was a big part of me. And also my ability to assimilate also had me climb the ranks. And through that time, unfortunately, it does a bit of an erasure of who you are as a person because you start to become your environment. And I, I felt like I lost myself. That's kind of where the title comes from too, being sidetracked. It's getting sidetracked from yourself because you just follow the steps that you're told you're supposed to do, you know, go to college, uh, get married, get a good job, buy that house, have your kids. And when I reached all of those milestones, I looked around and I didn't really know who was looking back in the mirror. And it was a, a, a time that I was actually really struggling for, with depression. And I mentioned I, I traveled 80% of the time. I actually lived part-time in Seattle. I had a condo there that my, um, my job uh, located for me. And I spent a lot of time just very lonely and, and wondering how I got here. <laughs> you know, um, this book is written around when I, I was about to turn 40. And so it was a point in my life where I had just enough of a career and just enough of adulthood where I'm looking back and I'm wondering, was this the life that I, I really wanted to live? And, and am I the person I really wanted to be at this point in my life? Right. You know, I think that's not such an uncommon sort of midlife crisis for all yes. kinds of people. <laughs> all kinds of people. <laughs> not just women of color, but um, I think a lot of men go through that uh, too, maybe at a little older age, but um, yeah. So you had a lot of depression going on. Did, uh, was this a good solution to, to these uh, issues for you to, to get sidetracked? I mean, ironically, you went to Albania and took on the life of a housewife, <laughs> which and is- in some ways, yeah, I guess that's sort of true. Um, I didn't really see it that way, but I can see how uh, that you might've got gathered that from reading the book. Um, because I did, I did shift and, and I don't see it as a housewife, I see it as a, a stay at home parent. Okay. Um, but yeah, think housewife is a bad thing. I just, you know, no, I understand. I understand, but, but it did, it shifted from, um, you know, a lot of my career driven life, not a parent driven life. And so it switched, it flipped. And what I said to my husband is for the first time in my life, I'm not going to be working. I mean, I was one of those folks that, you know, growing up, even at eight years old, I was mowing lawns and I was always wanting to work right. um, and finding identity outside of work was a big part of this leap and this journey. And to see that there's so many different ways to live that where work isn't the center of your world. And right. so you're right. What I did is I, I did make my my home life or parenting at home sort of the center but at the same time i used that time while they were at school to really do my own sort of self-discovery and therapy and and you mentioned this I, you know my book is a hundred days of journaling all i was doing and i didn't intend for it to be my book but i i'd always wanted to write a book uh, and i said to myself going over there that maybe i would come up with what my book was going to be and what happened was, as I'm journaling, that's what became the book. It wasn't until I got to close to 100 days that I thought, oh, wow, there's a real transformation here from where I started and sort of feeling allergic to everything in my life to then purging all of it and then adding pieces back that really brought me joy right. and brought me happiness and, I, and really building my identity back up again. Well, it's a great story. I, I really enjoyed it. It's so personal and it's so honest. And um, it, I'm, I'm really glad that you wrote it. it. I'm wondering to what extent did you feel an expectation to document your trip? I mean, being a creature of social media, which was part mm -hmm. of what you had to do for your career and something that you were very familiar with. To what extent did you have an, have an expectation to, to document it? Well, I'm already that kind of person. Even before social media, I was always with a camera in my hand as a kid. Uh, and, you know, I've always written. And so this was just me being me. I, I always journal. I have lots of journals that I've kept, but I've never thought of publishing any of my journals before. They're very, they're very personal. And, you know, I can say whatever I need to say and get out. And it's my way of processing things. A lot of times, you know, I don't even know what's in my head until it gets down on paper and I read it back to me. So 
that was a bit of a part of the therapy is seeing what was coming out, seeing what I was doing in my life and what I was observing and how that was changing me and capturing that along the way. It wasn't a, a, a labor, really. It wasn't, I didn't see it as work. It was creative expression, just like a, a painter would be getting out the emotions that they're feeling. I was doing it through my writing. Right, but you say in your book that having been so encumbered, if you will, by social media and the experts, oh, yeah. that that was, uh, it had made, you, you, here's a quote, this way of life had made my mind tired and my spirit, spirit dampened, burned out. And so you weren't yeah. doing social media to the great, same extent when you were over there, right? You were keeping in touch yeah. with family and friends, but. Um, That's right. I mean, we all show a certain side to us to social media. <laughs> I mean, I was sharing the photos, you know, along the way or the things that me and my family were going through at the time, but very surface level. And I did actually talk about how, you know, I was writing a lot and it, it, I felt like I was coming alive through that process. But the words that are in that book, no, that's not what I was sharing socially. And it was a, a true unplug. I mean, you don't realize how many things you're plugged into in a society until you are leaving it. <laughs> and you're subscribed to so many things. And, you know, that social media was a way to stay in touch back at home, but we were in a different time zone. So we were finding things out and starting a new day while things were ending the day before. Um, it was a very different way of feeling um, out of touch, but it became more personal. And, and I learned a lot from the Albanian culture and being around the people and this sort of, it was like going back in time. I, I tell my mom, I feel like living there felt probably like what my grandparents lived as a life. You know, there, it was not as um, addicted to convenience and addicted to social media in the sense of that's the way that you communicate. Sure, there's that want to be famous, <laughs> I think, in, in all young adults, especially. So we did see that a lot of Instagramming and those sorts of things going on. But people that would just sit and talk and enjoy one another and enjoy the food and the atmosphere, th that was the culture of Albania. It taught us to really slow down and enjoy one another in a very personal way. So how did living in Albania change your perspectives about your identity as an American? So I mentioned that I am a woman of color and living that life and living in that body, it gives you a, a, a lived experience of feeling of a different class, uh, sometimes even thought of as an other, instead of um, what socially is deemed as, um, you know, the, the leading class. And so when I went to Albania, it was very different for me because it, what, I didn't feel like they saw the color of my skin and my gender first. They saw me as American and what that felt like. Um, it, in the first time in my life, I was treated privileged. I was treated that I came from a place of privilege and that regardless of, you know, the fact that my, you know, on one side of my family, my grandparents are Filipino they, it didn't even enter their mind. They, I was already treated um, with a different, I don't know, I, respect is the, is the word, but there's more to that. Uh, there's a lot of love for Americans in Albania. There are presidents of this country that have done things for the country of Albania and it's revered. And I left America at a time that I felt the opposite for my country. <laughs> And so being in that presence of somebody that reveres a country that you consciously left yourself because you just felt like you couldn't even breathe in the society, it, it really did teach me a lot and, and took me into different perspectives I probably wouldn't have um, gone. Because when I live in a place, I inhabit a society. I don't, I'm not a, a tourist in, until I can get past the tourist part. I like to try to become a local. And so I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of people in Albania and have real candid conversations about the American privilege. And I write about this part in my book about there's a time where it's the golden ticket where people are applying to get 
visas to come over to America. And it's a very real thing. And many people, you know, really hold out hope for that and hope that they can either have a family member go so that they can eventually come. And sitting in a, in a society where you look around and you, you realize this may be the only place they ever see in their life, it really teaches you something. Uh, and you feel very grateful for your passport where you can go anywhere you want. And yet so many Americans don't ever leave their, their home that they grew up in, you know, but we have that ability and not every um, citizen of this world can do that. Right. So did this give you a whole different perspective on the meaning of the word privileged? I mean, in so many ways, a person can be privileged like mm -hmm. to, be, to be educated, to have the freedom to travel, um, to have a lot of money. Um, it's just yeah. an interesting concept. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it added quite a few layers that I just hadn't entered my mind just because of, like I said, the way that I, I lived in our society here in America. Um, and there it, it just, it was different. And also how that makes you feel, uh, you feel, <laughs> I don't, I can't, it's hard to explain, um, cause it's more of a feeling than there's words to talk about, but it's, it was something unlike I'd ever felt. Um, and you do feel more at ease and you do feel this freedom and independence very different than, than being driven through fear, which is a lot of the emotion that I was living for so many years. And that sort of started to um, break away on me. That, that, that can be all encompassing, that feeling of fear and anxiety and battling that it can be really, um, paralyzing <laughs> and when you feel like the world is is watching you but rooting for you and and wanting to get to know you as a person um and there's not a lot of barriers and it's very friendly it, it it's an environment to allow you to sort of spread out a little bit and and be yourself and i liked the kind of person that i became while i was there and there's a saying, yavash, yavash. It's, it's, a, it's a way to tell people to sort of just relax, just, just be in the moment and don't be in such a hurry. And that really changed me. And I think I'll ha carry that with me always because I'm sure you can imagine a woman coming up through corporate America, you know, traveling 80% of the time, working 80 hours a week, we're very high strung. <laughs> And so you take someone like me and you plug them into a world of Yavashavash, which is just like, relax. <laughs> it was jarring at first, but then I felt like it was like a warm, I don't know, blanket that I just put on and I really felt comfortable there. Uh huh. Did you ever feel unsafe in Albania? Um, maybe towards the end of our stay. I don't want to... Uh, spoil the book for those who want to read it. But yes, there, there were moments. Um, and it's really getting to know how that society functions. You know, it's not, I don't know who, if whether the listeners know much about Albania, but you know, they, they were almost 50 years in a, under communist rule, and they're still coming out of that. And there's a lot of things that they do as a society, you know, of this whole thought of scarcity. And then there's also a lot of poverty. Um, and there's, there are a lot of things that, that they're challenged with there, but they are in a very beautiful, almost untouched, uncommercialized, and tourism really hasn't grabbed a hold there, that um, when there are good things, people cluster. <laughs> people don't know how to line up, you know, there isn't a lot of order, and for someone who seeks order a lot, that's just the kind of person I am, that chaos can feel scary. Um, because it feels sort of you're out of your body in a, a little bit um, because you don't feel like you can have control, even though you really don't have control of those situations, even if there's order. So yeah, there were some moments, but it's a different kind of fear. Uh, it wasn't the same that I feel here, uh, but you know, we also weren't trying to be naive, you know, about being in a place that we just know nothing about and really just sitting back in those moments and watching and then joining in um, when we felt like things were safe because there were protests that were going on while we were there against right. the government. Now the book mm -hmm. 
the book is a, a, a tour of your personal reflections. And I'm wondering if you could share with us some of the larger lessons that you took from your experience. That's a tough question because there were quite a few, but I, I will say just the, in reflecting on the experience and also just the way I'm living my life now, um, I definitely look more towards the building of relationships with people one-to-one. -one. Uh, I, I learned that lesson of taking the time and investing in the relationships and in, in more past sort of that transactional relationship. So I really took stock in, you know, the people in my life and where I wanted to invest my time and energy and be very conscious about where I place that, both in like the personal life, but also the professional life. Um, you know, choosing places where I was gonna place my energy that I felt like it was gonna give me energy back. Uh, this cycle and way of living in a more minimalist way, but a very conscious, intentional way is something I took from my experience in Albania. Plus being very grateful for every day I get to live. I mean, I had this experience before the pandemic and in isolation, which a lot of us are still in. And I feel very fortunate to have traveled the places that I, I've been. You know, a lot of times we sit for nine, 10 hours in our work day at our desk. Well, we would use nine or 10 hours and drive to other countries. Uh, we traveled every other weekend and we lived a different way of, of living and discovering that there are different ways of living and different ways of seeing how to use time and our energy and then the connections with our community. I didn't feel like I had that much of a connection with my community when I was living here. And a lot of that is by my own fault, you know, um, hardly being here that's part of it but also just being in that convenience state and sort of the way consumerism is uh there's it's dehumanized <laughs> you don't know where things come from and you don't ask and when you're living in a community that's small you know where everything comes from you know the farm down the street is where these tomatoes are from you know that this is the person that brings in the milk. Like it is that small town there. There's one person that you go to, to get your bread. And I went to seven different places to get all the things that we would need to, to make meals. And that was okay to me. It was, that's just the, what, what you do. And along that path, you're meeting and greeting these same people all the time. And you're building a relationship where how you live your life is dependent on the livelihood of how they live their lives. Right. And, and that's how I came back here. And I really threw myself into dedicating my time and my energy and my talents towards helping the small business community here. Um, so much, especially recently is happening. Many people are doing life pivots, um, not, you know, leaving the, the country and going and doing what we did, but, in a lot of ways, just really thinking about how they want to live their life. And when you, you got unplugged from it because you were isolated in your home and realizing, well, this is a different way to live. And maybe there are parts here that I still want to keep, even when the world goes back uh, working again and people being in, indoors. What are the things that I want to keep from this experience? That's well, kind of what I did with Albania is I kept a lot of different pieces from it and we bring it into our daily life and and i feel like we live a more whole life that's connected to all the people around us well that's beautiful you obviously got a lot out of it your book reveals that i wish we had a lot more time there's so much more we could explore i mean obviously it's changed you it's changed your career you don't seem very depressed today <laughs> <laughs> not at all <laughs> I'm very happy for you, and I'm happy that you shared your journey with the rest of us. Now, before we go, I want to be sure to tell our listeners about your website. And I've got it down as www.sidetrackedbook.com. That's, That's sidetrackedbook.com. Is that the best one? That's it. It's also available everywhere, any retailer worldwide. So if you're just looking for Sidetracked, Amanda Maley, you'll find that book. Okay, great. And uh, I'm sure that they can find all the information at sidetrackbook.com. Absolutely.
And for those of our listeners who may have tuned in late uh, to Pathways today, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, the author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. Now, don't worry, you can play or share this interview whenever you want via the internet or as a free podcast, and I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with Amanda Maley, author of the new book, Sidetracked. Highly recommend it. I read it from cover to cover. Really fun read. Now, if you've enjoyed today's conversation, please help KBOO reach our $60,000 spring fundraising goal. KBOO is commercial-free, volunteer-powered radio made possible by people like you. If you are able to make a contribution today, please go to kboo.fm slash give to show your support. I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into Pathways, which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm every other Sunday morning at 8.30 USA Pacific Time. Even better, podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at divination.com, spelled D-I-V-I nation.com, as well as via iTunes and other free podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to Amanda Maley and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation.